three quarters of our planet is covered in water. The great oceans are sparsely populated, equivalent to huge deserts. Creatures of the deep must travel far in search of food. But here and there, submerged mountain peaks break through the waves. Remote islands in a desert sea. Ocean oases. In the Western Pacific, 500 miles east of the Philippines, the peaks of an underwater mountain range break the surface to form over 400 islands. They're the remains of coral reefs pushed out of the sea by underwater volcanoes. Exposed to the air, the coral died and formed these limestone islands. Surrounded by a magnificent barrier reef, these waters contain more kinds of coral and marine life than almost anywhere in the world. It's hard to imagine the colossal forces which once formed the ancient coral cliffs that now protect the rock islands of Palau. Regarded as one of the natural wonders of the world, the dense jungle-covered islands have been sculpted by the ocean. The tides sweep in and out, slowly carving these mushroom islands, which are made of the skeletons of millions of dead corals. Dense undergrowth clings to the tops, somehow finding enough nutrients and rainwater to flourish in this ocean oasis. But underwater, for millions of years, the corals went on growing. Living organisms themselves, reefs are like submerged towns and cities, home to hundreds of different fish and marine animals. The red-breasted splendor wrasse is one of more than 1,500 species of fish which live here. The coral gardens not only protect the small fish from their larger predators, they're the perfect environment for breeding and growing up. Cardinal fish make their homes among the coral branches which give them both shelter and food. Many fish cohabit with completely different species, even quite dangerous ones. The skunk clownfish eats scraps from the mouth of the sea anemone. There are many kinds of clownfish, and they've all developed immunity to the stinging tentacles, which are armed with poisonous harpoons. If danger threatens, the clownfish quickly takes cover. It's believed they release a protective chemical when they rub themselves on the anemone. But if the anemone closes up, the fish are left outside their protective host. Like the sea anemone, corals also use stinging cells to catch their food. Few parts of the world have so many different corals as Palau, where there are over 700 species. There are two types of coral, the hard reef-building variety and the flower-like soft corals. These plant-like animals feed on plankton, which they capture with their delicate arms. The hard corals are the reef builders. Reefs hundreds of feet high and millions of years old are the work of one of the smallest and simplest animals, the coral polyp. The polyps cement together, forming spectacular shapes and patterns, building on their external skeletons. Many hard corals are nocturnal and only extend their fleshy tentacles at night. This is the time for spawning. The strong currents play an essential part in distributing the reproductive cells. 
but of the billions of cells released, only a few will develop into larvae and then polyps that build new reef colonies. Most will be eaten with the plankton that comes like a snowstorm on the incoming tide. A white-tipped shark cruises the reef looking for a more substantial midnight meal. While the locals, like this parrotfish, tuck up for the night. A white-bellied butterfly fish has to work hard to stay put in the current. A scribbled file fish wedges itself into the coral. But slow-moving nudibranchs or sea slugs hitch a lift on the current as they graze on the coral for algae. And all the time, the hard corals are at their painfully slow task of building the world where all these other creatures play out their lives. The same ocean currents eventually brought man to these islands. No one knows exactly when people first came to Palau. They had no written language and passed on traditions and legends through their carved storyboards and murals on the walls of their meeting houses. Unfortunately, most of these were destroyed when European traders arrived and tried to stamp out indigenous beliefs. The murals that survived tell us something about the life here, but we can only guess what it was like for the cave dwellers. Cave paintings recently found give few clues, and with the sea level having risen over a hundred feet, it's unlikely we'll discover any more. The limestone cliffs are honeycombed with caves, many of which can only be explored underwater. One of the largest is Chandelier Cave. The entrance is through a large hole in the limestone footing of the island, 15 feet below water. If you want to see anything, you have to be careful not to disturb the fine silt on the bottom. The first of the four chambers are the stalactites that give the cave its name. There's an upper layer of fresh water that has filtered down through hundreds of feet of limestone overhead. The same process formed the stalactites centuries ago when the cave was dry. It's still forming them today incredibly slowly in the air-filled chambers. The air has also filtered through the limestone. It's a bit stale, but it's breathable. As you go further and further into these eerie caverns, it's easy to lose all sense of direction. Even with the lights, it's a job to know whether you're going up or down. Very few people have ever been here. And as you return to daylight through what seems to be a blue hole, you can't help feeling a sense of wonder at what you've just seen. And perhaps a sense of relief, too. There are dozens of lakes on the rock islands, formed when erupting volcanoes forced the limestone reefs upwards. In one of the lakes, landlocked for millions of years, there's something so interesting that scientists have come from all over the world to study it. Scientists, and tourists too, face a tough journey to get there. The 
first stage isn't too bad, but there's a hundred foot high ridge to climb. It takes 15 minutes to reach the lake and the trail's treacherous with razor sharp limestone projecting through slippery decaying leaves. It's not a good idea to catch hold of a tree for support. Some of them produce a black sticky sap which can blister the hands. The lake is a far cry from the sandy beaches and coral gardens. The mangrove roots add a distinctly somber note and there are stories that saltwater crocodiles have been seen here. The next stage is to snorkel through the mangrove swamp, a shallow, boulder-strewn obstacle course. A few small fish live here, but what we're in search of is a little further out, beyond the mangrove roots. A quirk of evolution. The jellyfish that have forgotten how to sting. Today, they live in a hazy cocktail of seawater and rainwater. When volcanic eruptions lifted up the reefs from the ocean floor, the jellyfish came too. Here they found few enemies, but not much food, and with nothing to practice on, their long, stinging tentacles became almost harmless stumps. Instead, the jellyfish came to rely on algae in their tissues, which use sunlight to make food for them. During the day, all the jellyfish, and there are millions of them, swim from one side of the lake to the other, keeping near the surface and rotating so the algae get enough light for photosynthesis. But at night, they leave the surface and sink to the bottom, where there's a layer of nitrogen which nourishes the algae. It may not be an exciting life, swimming to the other side of the lake in the morning and back again in the afternoon, but it is survival. And they do have company, moon jellyfish, who've also lost their power to sting. Just as the jellyfish found themselves here by force of circumstances, so did men, but much more recently. In 1944, the Japanese Navy fled to these peaceful lagoons, seeking refuge from the Allies. But like the jellyfish, they too found themselves trapped. Already blasted out of his base at Truck Island in the Caroline Islands, 1,200 miles to the east, Admiral Koga must have thought that he'd found safe harbor in this outpost of the Japanese Empire. A few vessels, including the Admiral's flagship, managed to escape, but the rest of the warships and supply ships of the Japanese combined fleet were trapped inside the reef. After two days of intense aerial bombardment, they were either sunk or sinking. It was the death knell for the Japanese Navy. Today, there's an eerie calm about these waters. The wreckage of war lies where it fell, one of a handful of Japanese planes that tried to defend their stricken fleet. By his own destructive actions, man has given something useful to nature. New surfaces where life can find a hold, nooks and crannies for the lagoon's natural tenants. He returns in peace to find that his former weapons have become the lionfish's home. Or a handy shelter for bannerfish. Some of the sunken ships have never been positively identified. Their nameplates were removed in salvage operations soon after the war.
This scrapyard under the sea has soon become something useful, a mini oasis seized upon by corals and colonized by the smaller fish who find shelter here. Although they make good homes for fish, these wrecks can still be dangerous to man and great care must be taken when diving in them. This supply ship went down with all its cargo, including spare parts and engines for fighter aircraft. Today's powerful underwater lights seek out earlier ways of lighting. oil lamps that were never lit, depth charges still primed and helmets that were never worn. Bottles of sake still unopened. Everything has been left as it was in respect for those who lost their lives. Nearly 50 Japanese ships went down around Palau, most among the rock islands, but only a few have ever been found. This is all that's left of a merchant vessel, pressed into war service and only lightly armed. In its gun barrel, a different kind of shell. In these waters, teeming with nutrients, the machinery of death now supports life. Bat fish have taken up residence here. They're inquisitive and always check out visitors. The nooks and crannies are ideal for colonization by the reef dwellers. Nature doesn't let much go to waste. The only enemy this ship has now is time and the sea. Mankind's peaceful activities have also had their effect on this ocean oasis. Early in the 20th century, the Germans mined phosphate from the inner islands they cut a shallow channel through the reef, a shortcut still used today. This potentially destructive act made the islands even more of a magnet to ocean fish. Only 10 feet deep, but a mile in length, German Channel creates strong tidal currents. Twice a day, the incoming tides bring visitors from the deep. At the entrance to the channel, a shoal of barracuda hang in the current, waiting for their prey. Barracudas are fast in attack and have long grasping teeth. Excited at the prospect of food, shoals of jack wait their turn in the tide. Other visitors to the mouth of the channel, drawn by their search for food, are the strangely beautiful manta rays. Mantas can measure 20 feet across and weigh over a ton. Yet the fuel for this huge machine is mostly plankton, minute organisms floating in the currents. With the skull-like markings on their backs, it's easy to see how some sailors christened them devilfish. However, mantas aren't dangerous to man. They don't have the poisonous tail spines of stingrays. Their name comes from the Latin word for cloak and in their stately progress, they certainly look as though they're wearing a loose, flowing mantle. But these slowly flapping wings are actually enlarged pectoral fins. Mantas almost always have traveling companions, remoras, which hitch a ride using suckers on their heads. The remoras clean the small patches of parasites from their hosts in return for food scraps which float past.
What look like horns on either side of the manta's head are another development of fins. They scoop plankton, small marine animals, and even small fish into the mouth. Fortunately, in German Channel, there's enough plankton even for these appetites. The currents that pour through German Channel carry nutrients to the shallow inner lagoon, where another kind of filter feeder makes its home. The giant clam is the largest bivalve mollusk. The living tissue, or mantle, contains light-sensitive eye spots which react to passing shadows, causing the clam to close the two valves of its shell. Also in the mantle are millions of microscopic algae. As the sun shines through the clear shallow water, they help the clam's respiration by absorbing carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. Some giant clams are about four feet long. The living clam can weigh 165 pounds and the shell another 400 pounds or more. The bigger the clam, the thicker its mantle, so that it's almost impossible for some to close completely. Clams have always been prized as a delicacy and are farmed commercially on the main Palawan island. The ones in the lagoon are protected and left alone. The waters of the Palawan Islands are so peaceful that it's hard to imagine the terrifying forces which made them. One of the most amazing natural features is a huge underwater cavern in the reef, a cavern the size of a cathedral. Eventually, parts of the roof fell in, and that's how you go into the cavern today through a hole in the roof. In these crystal clear waters, divers float as if they're in air. They descend slowly, dwarfed by the limestone cliffs and overhangs. 100 feet down, there's an entrance to another vast cavern. It's very narrow and a tight squeeze. Once inside it, even with powerful lights, it's not possible to see the walls. Deep in the cavern, there's a sharp reminder that you'd better not get lost. Turtles, like us, need to go up for air. The miles and miles of limestone labyrinths and cliffs remain virtually unexplored. Divers can only spend a short time at this depth, where there's an abundance of life still to be discovered. Twenty-five miles from the main island of Karor, on the outer edge of the Palawan Reef, is Blue Corner, here, the shallow waters drop dramatically to nearly a thousand feet. Massive shoals of fish come in from the deep ocean. They're taking advantage of a phenomenon that occurs on the incoming tide. As the currents hit the coral wall, nutrient-rich water is pushed up towards the surface. The smaller fish leave the shelter of the reef to feed, attracting the larger fish, starting the chain reaction in the feeding cycle. White-tip sharks constantly patrol the edge of the drop-off. The sharks at Blue Corner are far more interested in fish than divers and are amazingly unaggressive to human visitors on their reef. Many fish are inquisitive, like this Napoleon wrasse. 
Twice a day, the incoming tides bring a plentiful supply of food for all the inhabitants of the reef. Hawksbill turtles are now often seen, but they were once almost hunted to extinction. Conservation is not a new idea for the Palauans. Their ancient laws limited what they could take from the sea and helped preserve the wealth of life in the waters of Palau. It's now our responsibility to respect this beautiful, fragile underwater world where the shark has remained almost untouched for three million years in this ocean oasis. <laughs>